Well, good morning, everyone. How are you guys doing? Good. Awesome. We did not get stormed out of church today, so that is uh, great, eh? Yeah, well, maybe, right? Yes. <laughs> awesome. Well, let's, let's pray. God, I thank you for family and church family, and uh, God, yeah, just the the opportunity to once again worship your glorious presence and, and meditate on your beauty and glory and greatness. God, um, we just pray this morning that, um, God, you would do a work in our hearts. God, we're in a series called Walking in Freedom, and this is what we want to do in our lives. You purchased this freedom for us, and we want to walk in it, Lord God. So, Father, by your Spirit, just, just move and have your way in this place. Amen. By the way, uh, hi, Morden. They're streaming uh, me live right now. Hello, I'll look into that camera. Hi, Morden. Can you guys say hi as well? Hello. It's good to have you guys and just be you united this morning. So to, to enter my message, I, I want you guys to put yourself in the sandals of an Israelite. An Israelite, um, when they were in captivity in Egypt, so just imagine this, you're... You're a slave, really, right? And you don't belong to yourself, really. You belong to a nation that has power over you. And this is all that you've known for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. It's very ingrained in who you are. While you're an Israelite, that identity is almost taken away in the sense that you, you, you don't have freedom to do whatever you want to do. You have a slave master who's telling you what to do. And if you don't listen, you'll be whipped. But all of a sudden, Moses comes along. And, and Moses, all these miraculous things are happening, and, and suddenly Pharaoh says, go. He says, go, and you, you're marching to the Red Sea, but then Pharaoh's like, gotcha, and, and you, see, you see Pharaoh's army, and you're like, what? This is all, it's all leading us to die, but God splits the Red Sea, and you're, you, you're walking across the Red Sea, marching to your freedom, but, but Egypt is coming behind you, and you reach the end of the Red Sea, splash, the waters come back, Egypt's defeated, and, and you're free. You're free. That would be a bizarre feeling. You celebrate, woohoo, party time. You go to bed and the next morning you're free. Think of that. I don't know what a morning would have looked like for an Israelite, but they wouldn't have been free to sleep in however long they wanted. They would have had someone, hey, do this or you will pay. But now they're free people. And yet, one of the first things that they do as they're finding themselves as a nation, Moses goes up Mount Sinai and says, hey, God's going to give us commands and, and structure us as a nation and, and we'll, we'll, we'll be a, a nation for God, set apart for God. But when Moses comes down, they're worshiping a golden calf. Eek. Are they free, people? They're free in sense that Egypt's not telling them what to do anymore. They are kind of free from the power of Egypt, but are they free from the influence of Egypt? The answer to that is not yet. No, the ways of Egypt have infused into who they are as a person, and, and Egypt's culture and, and, and the Israelite culture and Israel's culture has been fused together. And I think this is, is our life too. Have we been set free from sin by Christ? If we've given our life to him, Definitively, yes. And are we going to party because of that? Definitively, yes. We will party. And we're going to sing about that, right? Um, we sang it last, last week when we sang, you, you stepped into my Egypt. You took me by the hand. You led me out in freedom and to the promised land. This is, this is our life. Look what Romans 6 says. Thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin... You have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. God has claimed your allegiance. You belong to God. He's your master now. You've been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Can I hear a hallelujah? Hallelujah. hallelujah. It's, this is an incredible fact. At the same time, one chapter later, the, t the tune totally changes and you're like, Paul, what's, what's going on? 
And this is what he says one chapter later in Romans 7. I've discovered this principle of life that I want to do what is right. I never really do what's wrong. Has that been any of you before? No. Okay. (laughs) Sermon over. (laughs) I love God with all my heart. He's, He's a believer. He wants to follow God. But there's another power within me that's at war with my mind. And this power makes me a slave to the sin that's still within me. What a miserable person am I. Who will free me from this life dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus has saved him and won the victory. So you see how it is. In my mind, I want to follow and obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature or sin flesh, I'm a slave to sin. So here's the thing, the victory over sin and death, Christ won. He purchased you. He he did lead you to freedom. He transferred you from the kingdom of darkness into a new kingdom. Amen? That happened. But at the same time, is there still a war going on in our minds? There still is. And so while Christ defeated sin and death ultimately, There's still this battle going on for freedom. And the hard thing is, is when you give your life to Christ, he makes you new, right? You're a new creation. Old things are gone. New things are here. He puts his spirit inside of you. But do you get a new mind? You don't really. You don't get a new mind. And so you're taking your old mind into your, this new life and this new kingdom, just like the Israelites did. Right, and this is where you have a problem here. In C.S. Lewis's book, the, the Screw Tape Letters, the book is actually, it's two demons that are writing back and forth to each other, and the demons are discouraged because uh, their subject gives, gives their life to the enemy, which is giving their life to God. And they're discouraged, but one demon writes to the other, there's no need to despair. All the habits of the patient, both mental and bodily, are still in our favor. They, they, needed, they needed to really renew their minds, right? And this is us as believers. We need to renew our minds because our, our mindset and our thinking and what's in our heart and in our mind often predetermines our actions. And then we find ourselves in this place where, oh, I want to follow God, but I just keep doing what's wrong, right? Because the truth needs to really renew us. It's one thing to come to church on Sunday and hear the truth. That's not really going to do it, right? When when someone cuts you off on on the road, it's too late to apply a sermon, (laughs) right? Oh, I remember. I remember what Pastor Claude said in 2017. I'm going to apply that message to my life right now. (laughs) No. Just... At that point, when the rubber hits the road, have you renewed your mind to truth? And your mindset and, and the way that you think is, is really going to come out. And so if, you're, if your mind is, is still ruled by Egypt and thinking like Egypt, you'll be in this place where you're still going to be sinning even though you're free. And so you're stuck there. Right? Not really. You're not stuck You're not stuck in that place because scientists are saying that your mind is moldable and shapeable. They called it neuroplasticity. It's like your mind is kind of like Play-Doh. It can be reshaped and it can literally change. Meanwhile, God's like, yeah, I I knew this all along. Thanks for catching up. (laughs) Look what Romans says, Romans 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your mind is being formed. Amen? Your mind is and has past, present, and future. It's being formed. Every day that you're on this earth, your mind is being formed. And really, it's being conformed or transformed, right? Ultimately, that's, what, that's the reality. 
It's being conformed and transformed daily. Daily, right? Because you can, you can transform your mind five years ago. Do you ever realize that it doesn't really count anymore? Hopefully it led to patterns that changed in your life. But if you don't keep, keep those things up, it, transforming your mind five years ago, you, you still need to transform your mind today. Right? So our minds are continually being formed. And we are called to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Look what happens when we renew our mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. This is exciting. Okay, church? Get excited. Get pumped up. If you don't have a transformed mind, you can renew your mind. And you can be transformed. And when you transform your mind, your mind is actually going to be able to decipher, this is not God's will. I'm not doing that. This is God's will. I'm testing and improving that. And you're going to be able to examine your thoughts and the patterns of life and be good at discerning what the will of God is and choosing that. Who wants that? I want that. I want that. I do not want to live this whole life, have Christ set me free and stay with the same mind as a slave to sin. That's gross, amen? Oh, I don't want that. I don't want to come to church on Sunday, hear an hour of truth and just be conformed the rest of the week. I want the Lord to transform my mind and all of us get that opportunity to transform our mind to be free so we can walk out the freedom that Christ purchased for us. I hope you're excited. So let's, let's look this morning at how can we do this? How can we renew our minds? I think the first thing that we're called to do is just examine and be aware of how our mind is being formed and has been formed already. Like I said, your, your mind has been formed and is being formed by ideas, relationships, Your upbringing, the culture uh, around us, what you're consuming in your life on a screen or through relationships, your habits, your daily rhythms, your environments, it's all forming you. All of this is forming you. And I have a doozy of a question for you this morning that I encourage you to take before God in your devotional life. The question is, are my daily habits transforming me into the image of Christ? Or are they conforming me to the world? That's a doozy of a question. And I think all of us need to kind of take an audit of our life and just take take a look and say, oh, okay, my relationships, okay, maybe I need to get closer to this person that looks like God so I can help It can help me to be transformed. Maybe this this show I'm watching is not good for my inner soul and I'm not feeding my soul. Maybe this music that I'm watching, I could actually just listen to music that glorifies and brings me to worshiping God. And all of us need to be aware of how how life is, is forming us and how all of these things and influences in our life are forming us. Because I don't want to be a, a product of culture. I want to be a product of Christ. Amen? How about you? Does that sound cool? I think that sounds really cool. Not to be a product of just culture and conform, but be a product of Christ and transform. So the next thing we need to do is we need to learn the ways of heaven and the culture of heaven. All of us live in in Egypt in a sense. We live in a world that perpetuates the lies of the enemy that doesn't think the way God thinks. And, and when you're, whenever you guys are entering, if you, if you ever travel, and if you're ever traveling to a culture that's very different than yours, it's probably best to, to just learn a bit about that culture. What are, what are the things that, that, you know, if I'm ignorant towards, I'll actually offend people. When, again, when I went to India, they told our mission team, you all have to wear pants. It's very offensive if you don't, right? And so we said, oh, that's good to know. So we, we did that. And in, in, in our culture, if you show the peace sign, if I, if I do this to you, what does it mean? Peace, man, peace, peace to you. If you go in other cultures and you do this, they'll get offended and they'll be like, what, wow, why, why are you doing that? Why are you offending me? 
I'm saying this because some of us have learned the culture of the world and it's offending God. Some of us just, just in our upbringing, uh, you know, Winkler and the world that we live in, it's good, but it's not always the culture of heaven. So I don't want to stay ignorant of these things. I, I want to know the ways of heaven. Amen? I, I, let, let's just pretend now I, I entered heaven's kingdom and heaven's country. I don't want to look like a heavenly tourist, right? With a, with a shirt that says, I love heaven. I've got my big camera and a big statue of an angel. You know, if you see someone in New York with an I love New York sign, it's a clear sign they're not from New York, right? They don't go to the souvenir shops and buy a, a, a souvenir of the Statue of Liberty. It's like, hey, yeah, they're not from here, right? And when I entered New York, it was clear I wasn't from here. People were honking at me and everything. I was like, is that just what you do here? I don't know. I'm not from here. But if, if, I, if I'm in the kingdom of heaven, do, I, wanna, I don't want to look like someone who just says I'm a Christian but not live that culture. I want to learn Christ genuinely. I don't want to be just a, a, a Christian by title. I, I want to know Jesus. Amen? I want to be shaped by him. I don't want to look like a Christian tourist. And look what it says in Ephesians. It really talks about this. Now I say this and testify to the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the fertility of their minds. They're darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them due to the hardness of their heart. And they have become callous and given themselves up to sensuality, greedy practice of every kind of impurity. But that's not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you've heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former matter of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. See, this is, this is the task of every believer, is to put off the old self that's been corrupted through deceitful desires. And this is where it gets tricky because, because our desires are deceitful. If we're deceived, we, don't, we won't even sometimes realize how we're offending God and not living according to his ways. So we're encouraged to put that life off and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new self created in the likeness of God in the true likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. We are citizens of heaven. Amen? Ambassadors of God. I'm called to be an ambassador of God. I'm called to actually look like God. To look like a Christian. When I say I am a Christian, I should look very different. I should not fit in in this world too. The way I love should be different. The way I treat people should be different because God and his kingdom is different, right? It's set apart. And so I need to rid my mind of the things of Egypt and the culture of this world and take on the culture of heaven. Not become, again, a product of circumstances and culture, but a product of Christ. And this is where Jesus invites us to discipleship. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I'm gentle and humble in heart. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Learn from Jesus. We're invited to do this. We're invited to, to not only learn apart from him, but to learn with him. He's put his spirit inside of us. That's going to help change us. Amen. And greater is the spirit that's in us than the spirit that's in the world or the power that's in the world. Huh? And so look, at, look what it says in Peter. By his divine power. How much power is that? Enough? I think so. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. And we have received this all by coming to know him. 
This is where you have an intimate relationship with Jesus. You, you read his truth. You immerse yourself in the culture of heaven. You learn the ways of Christ and not only learn it, but you fall in love with him. You behold him in a mirror. And as you behold him, you're being transformed from one degree of glory to another. Colossians 3 says, put on your new nature, your new nature. You have a new life. You don't live in Egypt anymore. You're not a product of the world anymore. You're in heaven. You're a product of heaven. So put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. Come on. This is, this is what we're invited to do in intimacy with Christ. The fact that we, we can come to his throne room. We can have a relationship with him. And we have the word of truth. And, and so if we really want to learn the culture of heaven, we need to mer- immerse ourselves in the things of God. Immerse ourselves in truth. If you want to learn a culture and a language, what's the best way to do it? Immersion. Immersion. Right? And this is, this is why God instructed Joshua, don't let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Immerse yourself in it. Meditate on it day and night. And then you'll be able to follow it. And you'll be prosperous and successful in all you do. Immerse yourself in who God is. Look to his face. And in this place, God is literally reshaping the way that you think. So you can test and approve the will of God. And when you do this work, that renewal will start to happen and you'll start to choose and recognize God's will in your life. Even old ways, you'll say, oh, wait, I thought that was right, but that's not heaven's culture. I'm choosing this way. And this is what we need to do, renew our minds. When we renew our minds and, and, and we've done this work, then I, I really think we're in this place where we're adequately ready to wage war, wage the war that's in our minds and to, and to fight and to conquer. Again, Paul says, another power is within me that is at war with my mind. If you're in a war, what do you usually have to do? Fight? <laughs> if you're in a war and you're not fighting, that's not going to go well for you, Right? And this fight, this war, it's not usually going to be necessarily easy, right? It might be a a struggle. It might feel hard at some times. That's that's usually war. And this is is the war that we're all in. It's a war for the, the, the battlefield is in our mind. And we want to conquer our minds for Christ. But again, there are enemies that will rise up and we need to fight against them. Look what 2 Corinthians says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not carrying on our warfare according to the flesh and using the weapons of man. We're not literally fighting with the sword. The weapons of our warfare are not physical. Our weapons are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying sophisticated arguments and every exalted and proud thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God. Lies. Lies and deception of the world that are from the ultimate liar, the father of lies. And we're destroying these lies. Look what it says. And we are taking every thought and purpose captive to the obedience of Christ. And this is the war that all of us are fighting for our whole lives. It's the war uh, of our minds to take these thoughts captive and make it obedience to Christ. But it's a challenging thing. Because some of us, how many of you know that lies come back and back and back? And you're like, I defeated it. I did this. And then all of a sudden it's back. And you're like, what? What are you doing back here? That's not fair, right? This is our life. But I'm, I want to use an analogy for all the young people. Um, I downloaded TikTok for this weekend, and I created an account. And, uh, and what I did, it, what my account is now filled with, it's kind of cool, it's, it's filled with cute baby kittens. <laughs> oh, it's so cute. You guys see that? It's amazing. 
It's cute baby kittens. Let's go to another feed. Oh, another kitten. Look at how show Mord in there. Everyone say, oh, cute baby kittens. There's some baby seals too that come up. I, I had to like those posts. They're so cute. But you know why my TikTok feed is showing me posts of cute baby kittens? I've dwelt on these. I've meditated on these videos. I've watched literally hundreds of videos of cute baby kittens. They're so cute. And now my, my, now my, my TikTok algorithm is, is, is learning that, okay, we're going to feed the, him videos of cute baby kittens over and over and over. And then I watch those videos and it, it, it reinforces that algorithm. I just want to ask you this morning, though, if your mind was a TikTok feed, what would your algorithm show you? That's a big question. And for some of us, we, we've dwelt on worry. We've, we've dwelt on hatred towards other people or judging other people. We've dwelt on lust. And so our mind is just re-showing us all of these things. We've taught our mind to think this way. And all of a sudden, we're, we're overwhelmed, Right? And on TikTok, the cool thing that you can do is you can say, when any video shows up, again, a cute baby kitten, well, this one's got goats, so I'm going to say not interested. And now they won't show me those posts anymore. Isn't that cool? But you can't really do that with your mind, right? I, I wish it was that easy. Oh, this is a bad thought, not interested, and it will never come in your mind again. That's not how it works. But what we can do is, is we have weapons, and that weapon is really the truth of God. And we can take every thought and purpose captive and make it obedient to Christ. What, what does that really look like? Let's say you have a lie that rises up against the true knowledge of God. Maybe you have bitterness in your heart towards a person, and a lie rises up. Oh, it's that person again. You see them, and you're just like, yeah, they're a snake. They did me wrong, and they, they're, they're just wrong. Oh, I hate them. I really do. I'm going to go find one of my friends and talk about them behind their back. That's going to make me feel better. Right? You're teaching your mind to think this way. So how do you take those lies captive that inevitably come? When that lie rises up, you say, God, I've had feelings of... of uh, of ill towards this person, God. I, I don't want to dwell on these feelings. I want to dwell on your truth, Lord God. God, the fact is that you made this person, they're created in your image. God, you have a way of seeing this person different than the way I do. Help me, God. Help me to see them the way you do. Holy Spirit, I need your, your actual help right now. I partner with the Spirit and, and, and help me to love them with an unceasing love that you love me with, God. God, you have forgiven me of my sin, so how dare I don't forgive them of their sin, Lord God. And I partner with you, and I forgive them. I bless this person, Lord God. I wish well upon them. I bless them in all the areas of their life. I pray that they would know the truth, and the truth would set them free as well. But I wouldn't rise above them with pride and see them lower as me, Lord God. So now what have you done? You've taken that thought, and you've made it align with the truth of God. Amen? And this is what we need to do with our life over and over and over. And that's when our algorithm will really change. The last thing that we need to do is we need to set our mind on God and the things of God. Here's the truth. When I downloaded my TikTok feed, there was no photos or videos of baby kittens. So I directed it to videos of baby kittens. There's a search tab, and what you can do is you can just type in cute baby kittens, and that's what you see over and over. Look at that, cute baby kittens for hours. And you just watch those, and you meditate on those things. But you are not, you are not helpless to the way that your mind is thinking, right? And the Bible in, it encourages us to direct our thoughts to the things of God. Don't just let your thoughts come at you. Don't just be a victim to how you're thinking. Set your mind. Colossians says, since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. Right? Because you, you, you don't belong to the world anymore. You've been raised with God. So set your mind there. 
Set your mind on his truth, the truth that's claimed your allegiance. Set your mind on the freedom that he's purchased for you. Set your mind on things above, your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on earthly things. And I love how it says set your heart and set your mind because it's not just, we're not robots, we have emotions and we need to set our emotions and our affections and our mind on the things of God. This is what we're called to do. And together as a community, we destroy lies. If you look up that Corinthians passage, it says we, we, we. This is our job. And so if you're struggling with a lie, call someone who's gonna pray over you and get truth. Call someone who's going to help you to set your mind on the things of God. Don't just do this alone and become a victim of just how your thoughts are leading you. If your thoughts are leading you to despair, set your mind on the hope that's in Christ. If your thoughts and and emotions are everywhere, is that you sometimes? (laughs) How many of you know that some days it's like my mind is... Oh, can I get, just get a new one today? Is there a reset button, God, that I can press? Honestly, it's ironic because this whole weekend, I was just filled with worry and anxiety. Part of me was really tempted to pray for the storm just to cancel church. <laughs> and I just didn't want to preach. I'm just perfectly being honest with you. I, but you can't stay there. I have to spend time in his presence and I have to get my wife to pray for me and I have to say, God, just, just help me, Lord. If there's any weight that I'm carrying that I shouldn't point that way out in me, God. And God, I just want to take time to worship you, to acknowledge you. God, right now, I think you're too small in my thinking. God, I want to spend time in your glory and splendor so I can see you accurately. Because when I see you truly, and I know you truly, and I experience the, the peace that you have that transcends my understanding, God, my understanding is I'm going to have to speak into a whole lot of people, and that's making me anxious, but you have a greater peace, God. You have a higher understanding. Help me to see the way you see, Lord, and help me just to be your humble vessel and speak your words. I had to do that not once, but probably a hundred times, and continually this morning a hundred more times so I can walk in the path that God has for me. Amen? I'll invite the worship team to come up. In Philippians, Paul is writing this passage from jail. And I'm wondering if he's writing it to himself as well because he says in it, now dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what's true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Again, he was writing this to the church in Philippi, but I wonder if he was also preaching this to himself. Paul could have been filled with worry. He had so many other worries to fixate on. Is he going to get away? Is he going to ever leave prison? Is he going to be killed? How are the churches that he just planted doing, even though there's false prophets that are preaching false gospels, will he ever see his friends again? Am I getting out of here, God? Is this it? Is this all I have? But he says, no, fix your thoughts. Be caught up with the realities of God. And God, I thank you that we can do this. Can we just stand and and pray? God, I just pray for every person here today that their mind is leading them to despair or the algorithm of their mind is in this unhealthy place. And they're reading Romans 7 and they're like, yep, that sounds like my life. I inevitably do what's wrong. God, I thank you that Romans 8 says there is therefore no condemnation. Oh, God, thank you. Thank you that you truly have freed us from sin. You truly forgive us. But God, we, we have a war to wage against this thinking in our mind that's against your truth, Lord God. Help us to wage that war together, not alone. Deception loves isolation, so let's do this together. God, help us to fix our mind on things of God. Help us to learn from you. Help us to take 
your yoke upon us. It's gentle and the burden is light, Lord God. Oh, we give you praise, Jesus. We give you praise. And God, I pray that we wouldn't be Christian tourists, but we would learn the culture of heaven. We would have our minds reshaped to really see who you, see you as you are, and to see the life that you have us to live as it should be, Lord God. To love like you love. To serve like you serve, Lord God. To give like you give. To forgive like you forgive, Lord God. Change us, God, and thank you that your spirit within us is, is willing to help us and teach us and lead us into all truth so we can be transformed by the renewing of our mind and test and approve what your will is for our life. Amen.